What's happening in the world coming up on NTD News. First, our top stories. The Fulton County Sheriff's Office says former President Trump and 18 other defendants will be booked at a Georgia jail as normal, normal procedure. Could there be an exception for former President Trump? Republicans in both houses of Congress are criticizing the Federal Trade Commission for destroying documents related to a probe. An organization called No Labels might run a third-party candidate in the upcoming presidential election. Democrat-aligned groups are now warning it could benefit former President Trump. A new poll shows that almost two-thirds of voters want a certain senator to resign. This comes after a recent health scare and at a time where almost 20 lawmakers are at least 80 years old. The governor of Hawaii is warning residents against selling land to U.S. mainlanders after the devastating fires. He doesn't want them to be taken advantage of. Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Chris Beers. Our top news is from Georgia. The Fulton County Sheriff says Trump and 18 others will be booked as normal. They're being accused of using criminal tactics to overturn the state's 2020 presidential election results. NTD's Melina Wisecup is on the ground at the jail. Melina, tell us, what can we expect? Hi, Chris. Good afternoon. So according to the sheriff, all of these defendants, and even including the really big name ones like Rudy Giuliani, Jenna Ellis, Mark Meadows, and even local big names such as the former chairman of the GOP uh, party here in the state of Georgia, will be booked here at this Fulton County jail per normal procedure. That means they will have a medical screening, they will have fingerprints, they will have mug shots taken. Now all this is under the circumstance that their lawyers don't already make an agreement to try to avoid this booking process. As for former President Trump, uh, the sheriff says that he's also not going to receive any special treatment, raising some speculations of if we could see that first real mugshot of former President Trump. However, in the past, Secret Service did make arrangements to avoid this in the name of protection. And this comes at a time when this jail right now is under investigation by the Justice Department because they uh, raised concerns of unsafe and unsanitary living conditions here at this jail. Now, that's what to expect as far as next Friday. They do have a next Friday deadline to surrender or their lawyers have to make some motion in order to avoid them from having this booking process. We'll have more updates on that later. Now, switching topics uh, to another related note, but it's actually very interesting about this Georgia case here and how it it relates to the D.C. case led by special counsel Jack Smith. So we did just report yesterday that the special counsel that's overseeing that election case of Trump in the uh, area of D.C., he did obtain very personal information from Twitter on Trump, things such as posts, even though if if they were drafts and never even sent, direct messages, even if they were deleted, or just draft messages that were never sent, location data, anybody that Trump followed or blocked, anybody who liked former President Trump's uh, posts during the time period of October 2020 of January 2021. So we learned that information earlier this week that Jack Smith has those records, and he did use this in his investigation. What's interesting about this is that since these two cases overlap quite a bit because they both revolve around the 2020 presidential election. A reporter asked the district attorney on the night of the indictment if she had been in touch with special counsel Jack Smith about the overlapping elements in these two investigations, and she said she would not comment on it. Now, moving on to how we've since seen Trump's lawyers respond, our sister media, the Epoch Times, is working to try to confirm this, but we have seen reports that his lawyers are urging former President Trump not to hold that press conference on Monday where he planned to unveil his report of election fraud here in the state of Georgia, saying that it would, it would only complicate their legal cha- his legal challenges. So this is a report that we saw on ABC. Our sister media, Epoch Times, is working to try to confirm that right now, and we'll have more updates as you tune back in with us later. Chris? All right. Thank you, Melina. An organization called No Labels might run a third-party candidate in the upcoming presidential election. Democrat-aligned groups are now warning of that scenario, saying it could benefit former President Trump. No Labels is a political organization. Its leadership is composed of both Republicans and Democrats. No Labels received approval to appear in the 2024 North Carolina ballot. This marked the seventh state in which the organization has secured ballot access. 
No labels might run an alternative candidate if the election turns into a rematch between former President Donald Trump and President Joe Biden. Many Democrats claim that such a candidate would take away votes from Biden and help Trump to win the election. Several groups aligned with the Democratic Party signed a pledge, saying they call on no labels to halt their irresponsible efforts to launch a third-party candidacy. Their candidate cannot win, but they can and would serve as a spoiler that could return someone like Donald Trump to office. No Labels recently told Politico that it will exit the presidential race if the GOP nominates any candidate other than President Trump. Senator Joe Manchin is said to be the most likely candidate if No Labels decide to run. He was the keynote speaker for No Labels Common Sense Town Hall event. During the event, he was asked whether his potential candidacy would act as a spoiler for the 2024 presidential race. To which he replied, I've never been in any race I've ever spoiled. I've been in races to win, and if I get in a race, I'm going to win. With that being said, I haven't made a decision. It's important to note that since 1968, no third-party presidential candidate has won electoral votes. A new poll shows almost two-thirds of all voters want Senator Mitch McConnell to resign. That's due to concerns over his age and his ability to perform his duties. This comes at a time when almost 20 U.S. federal lawmakers are at least 80 years old. Here's the story. Redfield and Wilton Strategies recently conducted a poll for Newsmax. They found that 64 percent of eligible voters want Republican Senator Mitch McConnell to resign. More Trump voters want McConnell to step down than Biden voters. Asked about McConnell's age and his ability to continue working, 42 percent of voters said that they were very concerned. 23 percent were fairly concerned and only 18 percent were slightly concerned. The 81-year-old McConnell recently suffered a health scare during a press conference. Almost immediately after starting to speak at the event, he appeared to freeze up. The senator stopped talking and for about 20 seconds only stared straight ahead. This prompted his Republican colleagues in the Senate to assist him. Senator John Barrasso then helped McConnell from the podium and to his office. He later returned for the Q&A, where reporters asked him about the incident. Currently, almost 20 congressional lawmakers are at least 80 years old. In the House, 15 representatives are 80 or older, and in the Senate, four have reached that age. Those are 90-year-old Democrat Dianne Feinstein, 89-year-old Iowa Republican Chuck Grassley, 81-year-old Vermont Independent Bernie Sanders, and Mitch McConnell. Earlier this year, Senator Feinstein was absent for work for nearly three months. She was hospitalized for neurological complications from shingles. And President Biden repeatedly seems to stumble over his words and struggles to finish sentences. The problem was too many people are working or working people are working, making too much money. That's not the problem. Some voters have been calling for age limits and possible cognitive ability checks. However, no plans have been made for either of those. Former President Trump previously said he'd agree on doing such a check, saying he's confident he'd pass. Turning to the Bidens, lawmakers are split on the Hunter Biden investigation, with Democrats saying it's a distraction, while the GOP says revelations in it prove corruption. Democrats on the House Oversight Committee are alleging Republicans are using the Hunter Biden investigation as a distraction from Trump's indictments. They cite the release of the former FBI agent's transcript at the same time a Georgia DA was preparing an indictment against Trump. All the while, the Oversight Committee has shown money flowing from China, Russia, and Ukraine into accounts linked to Hunter Biden, and Republicans allege Hunter sold access to his then-VP father while paying Joe Biden's credit card bills. This accusation stems from a text in which Hunter claims to have paid his dad's bills for 11 years. The text conversation appears to show that Hunter either had an AT&T account or a Wells Fargo account shared with Joe Biden. House Oversight Chairman James Comer wants unredacted emails involving Joe Biden while he was vice president and his son Hunter related to Ukraine and Burisma. The committee has requested access to National Archives records. Comer's request also includes drafts of Biden's speech delivered to the Ukrainian parliament in December 2015. Republicans in both the House and Senate are teaming up to crack down on the Federal Trade Commission. 
That's for the alleged improper destruction of documents. Senator Ted Cruz says the agency likely violated federal law and interfered with congressional oversight of records. Republicans say the agency deleted documents requested by Congressman Jim Jordan in Connecticut to an investigation, in connection to an investigation. A year and a half earlier, the FTC's watchdog reported multiple failures in the agency's record keeping. Jordan requested documents about the agency banning non-compete clauses for private employers. Those prevent workers from joining competitors or starting similar businesses for a certain time. The IRS could be putting taxpayer data at risk. The agency is criticized for not working fast enough to correct cyber vulnerabilities. More in just a moment here on NTD News Today. Did you know ESG is impacting every part of your life? From rising gas prices to global food shortages to out-of-control inflation, even losing your freedom of speech and being censored on the Internet. It's all being driven by ESG ideology. Who's in control? What can you do about it? Find out in The Shadow State, the first documentary exposing ESG. The ESG movement of governments and corporations operates in the shadows. Only the light of truth can expose it. Watch The Shadow State documentary, streaming now. Anyone who's ever sold a home can tell you it is really hard. That's why who you work with matters. Together with Homelight, we've helped thousands of people sell faster and for the best price. You're not going to get it all right. Just make sure you nail the big stuff. Mama! Like making sure your kids are in the right seat for their age and size. Get it right at NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. To a child, this is what conflict looks like. Children in Ukraine are caught in the crossfire of war, forced to flee their homes. A steady stream of refugees has been coming across all day. It's bitterly cold. Lacking clean water and sanitation, exposed to injury, hunger. Exhausted um, and shell-shocked from what they've been through. Every dollar you give can help bring a meal, a blanket, or simply hope to a child living in conflict. Please call or go online to givenowtosave.org today with your gift of $10 a month. That's just 33 cents a day. We cannot forget the children in places like Syria, born in refugee camps, playing in refugee camps, thinking of the camps as home. Please call or go online to givenowtosave.org today with your gift of $10 a month. Your gift can help children like Ara in Afghanistan, where nearly 20 years of conflict have forced the people into extreme poverty. Weakened and unable to hold herself up, Ara was brought to a Save the Children Center where she was diagnosed and treated for severe malnutrition. Every dollar helps. Please call or go online to givenowtosave.org today with your gift of $10 a month, just 33 cents a day. And thanks to special government grants that are available now, every dollar you give can multiply up to 10 times the impact. And when you use your credit card, you'll receive this special Save the Children tote bag to show you won't forget the children who are living their lives in conflict. Every war is a war against children. Please give now. Welcome back. Hawaii's governor vowed to protect local landowners from what he calls being victimized by opportunistic buyers from the U.S. mainland. Maui will need to rebuild from scratch from the deadly wildfires that incinerated a historic island community and killed more than 100 people. Governor Josh Green said Wednesday that he instructed the state attorney general to work toward blocking land transactions in the devastated Lahaina locale, even as he acknowledged the move would likely face legal challenges. Lahaina native Richie Palale says locals now fear a rebuilt town could become less affordable. Many in Lahaina struggled to afford life in Hawaii before the fire. Statewide, a typical starter home costs over $1 million. A Forbes analysis says the average renter pays 42% of their income for housing. That's the highest ratio in the country by a wide margin. 
The 2020 census found more native Hawaiians living in the mainland U.S. than the Hawaiian Islands for the first time in history, driven in part by a search for cheaper housing. A new twist in the case of the controversial buoys on the Rio Grande. The floating barriers are meant to stop illegal border crossings, but a federal court filing says most of the buoys are on the Mexican side of the river. The court documents cites a survey from the International Boundary and Water Commission, which found that about 80% of the buoys are in Mexican territory. Texas has previously claimed constitutional authority over deploying the buoys. The U.S. and Mexico are now in discussions on how to proceed. The Department of Justice filed a suit against Texas last month demanding the removal of the border barriers and blocking future floating barrier construction. An injunction hearing is set for next Tuesday in Austin. The Inflation Reduction Act critics aren't buying Biden's message. They say one year on, implementation of the act is a mess. I spoke with James Broll, economist and senior fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, about his recent article, Critical of the Act. James Broll, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. In an article for Forbes, you wrote that Democrats' own energy and environmental regulations are affecting implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act. How so? Sure. So for decades now, Democrats have been pushing for environmental regulations and energy regulations that make it harder to build in this country. And now that they want to transition from a fossil fuel based energy sector toward a renewable energy sector, they're finding that their own regulations are making it harder to get permitting approval to build new uh, wind and solar facilities build offshore wind farms, and even just to connect new facilities to the grid so that wind and solar power can start powering homes. We know Democrats are pushing for uh, more federal control over infrastructure decisions traditionally left to the states. What are the pros and cons of that sort of federalization? Sure. So the background for this is that, it, interestingly, a lot of the renewable projects are getting started in traditionally red or Republican districts and states. Um, and so that's causing at the local level, a lot of Republicans even like the Inflation Reduction Act to some extent. Um, but it's also giving uh, Republicans more control over some of the implementation of this act. So from the standpoint of Democrats in Washington, D.C., they would like to have more control over the implementation. And so the pros and cons are how much local input should you have in where transmission lines get built or where wind and solar facilities are built? Uh, should you let Washington override local decisions when they don't, when they have a problem with some of these uh, decisions? Or should you let local de decision makers have more control, but maybe it takes longer? Now tell us, you know, countries like South Korea have found loopholes in uh, the Acts Buy America provision. What are these loopholes and how are they being taken advantage of? Sure. So a major goal of the Inflation Reduction Act was to spur more domestic production of, uh, of electric vehicles in this case. Um, and so there were prohibitions against being able to access subsidies for purchasing electric vehicles if the, if the vehicles were assembled in other countries. However, countries like South Korea have discovered that if the vehicles are being leased, then they can be assembled in other countries. So this is a loophole. So what it means is um, that there's been a big spike in the number of foreign made electric vehicles that are leased. And this could have counterproductive imp impacts environmentally if leased vehicles are turned over more often, that could mean more electric vehicles have to be produced over time. And there's a lot of environmental consequences just from producing these vehicles in terms of the batteries and the minerals and the raw materials that go into them. James Brill, thank you for joining us again. Thanks so much. Retirees could see their Social Security benefits reduced by $17,400 in 2023. That's as funding for the program diminishes over the coming decade. Here to discuss this recent analysis is NTD Business's Don Ma. Don, why are people making these dire predictions about Social Security benefits? Yeah, so Chris, here's the thing. 
The Social Security program is funded by the Old Age and Survivors Insurance Trust Fund. And it's projected that this trust fund would deplete its reserves by 2033, as you mentioned earlier. Now, this is according to the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Um, now, what that means is that 70 million retirees, dependents, survivors, you know, and regardless of age, income, or need, they're going to see their benefits be cut by nearly a quarter, so 23% to be exact, and that's a lot. Um, it's, it's unfortunate, but this is what the projections are. Now, Don, presidential candidates often talk about not touching Social Security benefits, but in this case, uh, if they don't touch Social Security benefits, um, we could end up in the situation like we're talking about. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Chris. But here's the thing. When politicians try to do something to make it better, um, history has shown uh, often it actually doesn't go the way that it's intended to go. Um, so what politicians have done in the past are uh, trying to add additional amendments to Social Security, expand the participation in the program. And that has actually made it made the situation worse because if more people are participating in the program, um, funds are will, will deplete faster. Now, Don, it's worth noting that between Social Security and Medicare, that's about two-thirds of the nation's budget. But um, just in closing here, wrapping up, can anything be done to secure the Social Security benefits for the future? Yeah, I mean, various measures have been proposed to keep the Social Security program healthy. Um, I'll list a couple here. Um, that's including raising the age of eligibility, increasing taxes, and relying more on general revenue to fill any gap in funding. But I think the core of the problem is actually not that simple. Um, and it, it's not as easy to fix as we say it is because Part of the problem is a demographic issue. You, you don't have enough people paying into it compared to uh, compared to before. So, and that's because the American population is aging and the workforce is shrinking. So, what we need to do is to promote demographic growth, and, and that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and it, it ties into having a strong economy at, as well. If you want to have a strong economy, you have to have more entrance into the economy, into the workforce. You need to have more births. Um, and we're trying to solve that a little bit right now with immigration. But the type of Im immigration right now is, is not actually the right type. You need to promote a higher income earning class. So they pay more into social social security. You need merit-based immigration. But you know, it's a long. It, it could be a long discussion. But you know, long story short, I think we need to have population growth. All right, NTD businesses, Don Ma, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. The IRS employee count is reaching decade high levels. Hiring at the tax agency has risen by more than thirteen percent over the past year. Here's the story. IRS Commissioner Danny Werfel says the IRS is close to reaching 90,000 full-time employees. That's according to the Federal News Network. The IRS's 2022 data book shows the agency had 79,000 full-time positions in 2022. This means hiring at the IRS has risen by more than 13% over the past year. The last time the IRS employed more than 90,000 people was 2012. Staffing dipped below 80,000 in 2015 and remained below that level until now. The jump in hiring comes as the tax agency was granted $80 billion under the Inflation Reduction Act last year. Werfel told reporters that the agency is utilizing the funds to make an immediate, meaningful difference to deliver the service taxpayers and the nation deserve. He also pushed back against claims that the IRS intended to boost the number of its armed agents. Republicans have criticized the funding boost, worried that it could lead to an enforcement expansion. The IRS said earlier this year it intends to hire 87,000 new employees over a 10-year period. The IRS is scrambling to plug cybersecurity gaps after a Treasury watchdog found that the tax agency hasn't done enough to make sure its computer systems are safe. It means hackers could steal or otherwise compromise sensitive taxpayer information. Federal laws require all federal agencies to identify IT security vulnerabilities, come up with plans to fix the gaps, and then document the resolution of the problems. 
The Treasury watchdog said in a recent audit report that between 2005 and 2022, the IRS created over 10,000 corrective action plans to address various cybersecurity weaknesses. But of those plans, the IRS has failed to finalize over 2,000 of them. Efforts to complete them are still ongoing. The watchdog says that's too slow. Some of the vulnerabilities were in- identified six years ago. The watchdog wrote, quote, the IRS is not accurately identifying and tracking the resources required to resolve information security weaknesses. The IRS said it agrees with the watchdog's findings, blaming staffing shortages and acknowledges it had failed to keep pace with increasing workloads. It pledged to take a series of steps to bolster IT security. Still to come, a rare flesh-eating bacteria killed three people in Connecticut and New York. Authorities say the bacteria live in water and can infect people with open wounds. And New Jersey's highest court rules that a Catholic school can fire an unmarried pregnant teacher. And the death penalty may be off the table for several 9-11 suspects. Families of some victims were notified about the possibility. We'll have the details soon when we return. NTD's Capital Report. It's about getting answers. Cutting through the fog of politics. It's about your questions and our chances to ask. What is the net impact of the American Carson Graves? Thank you for joining us. We're speaking to those in power to find out what does this mean for the people. We're here so you are in the know. Thanks for staying with us. Three people have died in Connecticut and New York from a rare flesh-eating bacteria. Authorities say two people in Connecticut became infected and died after swimming in two separate locations on Long Island Sound. The virus was also detected in a person who died in Long Island, New York. Officials are investigating to determine if that person contracted the bacteria in New York waters or elsewhere. The Vibrio vulnificus bacteria lives in warm, salty, or brackish water and comes from the same family as the bacteria that causes cholera. People with an open wound, such as a cut or scrape, a recent piercing, or a new tattoo are more likely to contract the bacteria. Doctors say it's important to seek treatment quickly if you develop a skin infection after possible exposure. According to the CDC, the bacteria causes an estimated 80,000 illnesses and 10 deaths in the country every year. A cyber hack has left Massachusetts residents with compromised data. It was part of a massive event exposing the data of millions worldwide. Massachusetts health officials were the bearers of bad news for over 130,000 residents. This week, they began mailing warning letters to those enrolled in state-run programs. The data breach happened through a file transfer system called MoveIt, used by the UMass Chan Medical School. MoveIt is used globally by companies to ship large amounts of sensitive data, social security numbers, medical records, and more. Cybersecurity firm MCSoft says the hackers have stolen data from nearly 700 companies and 40 million people worldwide. Massachusetts officials say hacked information included the person's name and maybe their address, social security number, financial accounts information, and protected health data like diagnosis details. New York City is banning TikTok on government-owned devices. It's the latest local government to take action against the China-owned social media platform. The office of Mayor Eric Adams said yesterday that TikTok poses a security threat to the city's technical networks. New York City agencies are required to remove the app within 30 days. Employees will lose access to the app and its website on city-owned devices and networks. New York State has already banned TikTok on state-issued mobile devices. Top security officials, including FBI Director Christopher Wray and CIA Director William Burns, have said TikTok poses a threat. TikTok has more than 150 million American users. More than half of all U.S. states have banned the app on government devices. 
Child social media stars in Illinois will now have their earnings protected. Illinois is the first state to pass a law establishing safeguards for minors who are featured in online videos and how they're compensated. Illinois Governor J.P. Pritzker signed the bill into law last Friday. It amends the state's child labor law and allows teens over the age of 18 to take legal action against their parents. That's if they were featured in monetized social media videos and not properly compensated. It's similar to the rights held by child actors. Starting July 1st, 2024, parents in Illinois will be required to set aside 50% of their earnings for a piece of content into a blocked trust fund for the child. This will be based on the percentage of time a child is featured in the video. So if a child is in 50% of a video, they should receive 25% of the earnings. This only applies if the child appears on the screen for more than 30% of family vlogs in a 12-month period. A court has ruled that a New Jersey Catholic school has the right to fire a pregnant, unmarried teacher. The school says she broke their code of ethics on premarital sex. Victoria Cristitello claims she was a victim of discrimination. The school says its actions were in accordance with church teachings. Cristitello attended the St. Teresa School in Kenilworth, New Jersey, and worked there starting in 2011. When the school asked her if she would like to teach art full-time in 2014, she said she would need more pay because she was pregnant. A few weeks later, she was fired and replaced by a married woman with children. The Supreme Court of New Jersey said Cristitello twice signed forms that bound her to follow the school's code of ethics. 9-11 defendants may avoid the death penalty under plea agreements being considered. Families of some of those killed in the terrorist attacks were notified by the Pentagon and FBI this week. It comes one and a half years after military prosecutors and defense lawyers began exploring a resolution to the case. The suspected architect of the attack and four other defendants were captured at various times and places in 2002 and 2003. They were sent to Guantanamo for trial in 2006. Some relatives of the people killed outright in the terror attacks expressed outrage over the possible deal. Prosecutors vowed to consider their views and present them to military authorities before making a final decision. One man who lost a son in 9-11 says he's deeply frustrated the case is still unresolved. The FBI had no comment Wednesday on the letter. A trial date has not yet been set. Still to come, Russia launches its first lunar mission in almost half a century. That's in a bid to get a head start in the new race to the moon. And with employment soaring high in China, job seekers are turning to ride hailing to make ends meet. The market is now feeling the squeeze. Stay tuned for more on that when we return. Hey Bobo, do trees tell each other stories? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, why don't we go find out? Listen. Do clouds take naps? I couldn't tell you. Dad, do stars visit their friends? Look! My dad's name was David. He always talked about getting life insurance, and now it's too late. No one was expecting my husband Dave to suffer from a heart attack. We didn't have life insurance. We thought we had more time. Don't be Dave, and don't wait until it's too late to get the life insurance coverage you need. And if you don't have enough insurance to cover funeral costs, credit card debt, and other expenses, your family is going to get stuck with the bill. Call now to get affordable life insurance. Just call. 800-494-1562. 
If you're over 50, you can't be turned down for this insurance regardless of your health. Plus, there's no medical exam, no health questions. Your rate will never go up. Your coverage will never go down. And rates start as low as $5 a week. Remember, don't be Dave. Call now. Call now. 800-494-1562. William Bouguereau's staggering work, both in quantity and quality, numbered over 800 exquisite paintings during his lifetime. Bouguereau was an, the most famous artist in all of France, possibly all of Europe. These are emotionally powerful works, amongst the most powerful in art history. 我第一次看到就是布格罗的画的时候，我就感觉到非常的震惊。我觉得哇，自然有人画到这么的完美，所有的一切都无可挑剔。In this episode, we'll investigate the talent of a genius and a true master in his field, who was first highly praised and recognized, but later destroyed. What was it about him or his art that made an entire society turn against him and banish both his name and his works? Back to the news. Target sales are down amid boycotts over LGBTQ products. According to Justin Danhoff, head of corporate governance at Strive Asset Management, the company says its Pride Month displays and products damaged their bottom line. I spoke with Dan Hoff about Target's profit slip. Justin Danhoff, thank you for joining us. Hey, Chris, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Justin, tell us about the pushback Target received for selling LGBTQ-related products. Yeah, so the pushback was strong and severe, and why was it? It's because there's two things when it comes to parents that you don't mess with. That's their money and their kids. And Target's merchandise during Pride Month was a direct attack on children. And so for the first time in six years, they saw quarterly sales drop this past quarter. Tell us a little bit more about the effect. What kind of numbers are we seeing? Yeah, significant. Uh, we're talking into the tens of billions of dollars in losses. And again, this happens because Brian Cornell, the CEO, learns lessons very hard. They haven't had quarterly losses like this in six years. What happened then? That was when Target opened up their changing rooms and restrooms to anybody of any gender on the subjectivity of what they claimed they were that day. So grown men could go use the same changing room as little girls. That's the last time they saw sales drop. So the lesson here is why enter the culture wars at all? It clearly affects the bottom line. And how much of these uh, changes to their bottom line are related to um, overall inflation and price increases that we've been seeing, would you say? Yeah, there's certainly, a, that, that's happening across the board, absolutely. But on the earnings call, Target had to admit what's material. So companies have to tell investors and would-be investors what's material to the company. And they admitted that the backlash to their Pride Month displays and clothing was material and had a material hit to the bottom line. Now, how is Target balancing the tension between consumers who want LGBTQ products and those who don't? Well, it's interesting. Um, they did change some of the displays in you know, reaction to parents that were upset. At some stores, they simply moved them to a different area of the store. So they did take action in response, but they really leaned into it. Look, they fund organizations that tell teachers to not tell parents when kids are transitioning or changing clothes at school to pre present as a different gender. So. While they did make some ostensible changes in the stores, they're still really leaning into their position on these issues. Tell us about the messages Target received from both Democrat and Republican attorneys general. Yeah, so you know they're, they're a target on both sides and that, that's just it. Why are they getting letters from Republicans and Democrats on issues that have nothing to do with their core customer base? It's because they've lost focus of their mission. Let politicians fight political battles. Target should simply be providing the best products that their customers want and demand. They don't belong in the political battles or the culture wars. That's what politicians and culture warriors are for. 
Now, Justin, we've seen numerous boycotts on companies promoting LGBTQ-related products like Bud Light and now Skittles. Are these boycotts having an effect on the overall corporate environment? I think so. I think Bud Lighted has actually become a verb. Like companies don't want to get Bud Lighted right now. And so I, I think that corp this was an instance where a Bud Light specifically really lost track of who their customer is, who their customer base is. And that's why the backlash is so profound and so long lasting. And so I, I do think that corporate America for a very long time thought they could offend a segment of the population with impunity. And I think that era is starting to close. Justin Danhoff, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Chris. The race to space is heating up. China and Russia are stepping up efforts to overtake the U.S. Moscow on Friday launched its first lunar mission in almost 50 years, looking to make a historic discovery. What's driving the new race to the moon? Major powers like the U.S., China, Japan, and the EU have all been probing the moon over recent years. A Japanese lunar landing failed last year, and an Israeli mission failed in 2019. There's been a focus on the South Pole, where no country has been able to reach yet. Rough terrain makes landing difficult, but the prize could be historic. Ice that could be used to extract fuel, oxygen, and drinking water. Russia and India are racing to get there first. Yeah, Russia's aspirations towards the moon are mixed up in a lot of different things. There's always been speculation that there's water on the moon, and that's important if you, if you want to build permanent settlements on the moon. So I think what Russia is trying to do is really spearhead that investigation and like be at the forefront of it. So this, the fact that they're exploring the South Pole isn't an accident. Astronomers have wondered about water on the moon for centuries, which is 100 times drier than the Sahara Desert. It was only in 2020 that NASA confirmed the existence of water there. India sent up its Chandrayaan-3 lunar lander last month after the Chandrayaan-2 failed in 2019. But Russia may also have political ambitions behind its space missions, especially as it faces sanctions from the West over the war in Ukraine. First and foremost, it's an expression of national uh, power on the global stage. Russia wants to go to the moon, partly to assert its national place on the, with the big, big guy, so to speak. China has already announced plans to return humans to the moon. The U.S. has a major prog program called Artemis that it is uh, in, in the middle of. So there's a lot of act activity going on. Uh, Russia, because it lacks the economic power of the United States, has allied with China. So it's possible that what the Chinese do, the Russians may actually piggyback on top of that um, in the next 10, 15 years. More and more job seekers are turning to options like ride hailing to make ends meet. That's the case in China, where the market has seen a 7% increase in recent months. What hints does this offer about the nation's unemployment troubles? Let's dive in. As China's job market shrinks, a rush of newcomers is oversaturating gig economy jobs like ride hailing. It's eating into the income of existing full-timers like Li Wei Min and dragging out his work hours. He's near Shanghai's most prominent train station, which used to be a hot pickup spot. But he's out of luck, or possibly the competition for customers is now just much tougher. I must persist because after all, due to the effects of the pandemic, even if I want to give up this job, it's difficult to find other jobs now. There is no other job to find. China saw 400,000 new registered ride-hailing drivers in the sector between April and July, flooding the market with a 7% surge. It comes as the world's second largest economy has sputtered, trying to pivot out of some of the world's harshest lockdowns, with youth unemployment soaring. China's Statistics Bureau said on Tuesday it would suspend releasing youth jobless data after record high readings, over a fifth unemployed as of June. Market analyst Wang Ke points out ride hailing naturally became the first choice for quick cash for a growing number of jobless people. 
Because of the impact of three years of the pandemic, many companies and small enterprises may have gone bankrupt or gone out of business. So a lot of idle labor will enter the market. There's also been a sharp decline in the number of jobs. Some cities like Shanghai have suspended issuing new ride-hailing permits. But even with less drivers, economists say making a living is likely to become more difficult for many people in China as it enters a period of much slower economic growth. For many in the ride-hailing sector, each day is bleaker than the last, working longer hours to earn the same money they did months ago. It's the only option for those with family to support, like Zhu Jimin, who spends 15 hours behind the wheel. The only thing on my mind every day is just making money because our parents are getting old. My kids are going to junior high, high school. Conditions for my family aren't great. So why am I so hard working? It's because there are a lot of ways my family needs to use the money. China's official data says over a fifth of its young workforce are unemployed as of June. The regime has a history of underreporting data that reflect poorly on its economy. Frank Xie, professor of marketing at the University of South Carolina, says the real number could be as high as 30 percent. When we come back, moped sidecars and river rafts show tourists unique views of Rome. We'll take you on the unusual tours of the Italian capital when we return. Hey, I told you enough of that. But look, this is different. It's Ganjing World. Ganjing World. Family friendly entertainment. Say goodbye to harsh, bitter coffee and hello to a delicious, smooth brew. With specialty quality beans expertly roasted in house, you'll taste the difference with every sip. Fermented with a blend of 50 enzymes. Today's coffee delivers a rich brew like no other. Made with the highest grade specialty beans available, you're sure to taste the difference. Elevate your morning with Day's Enzyme Fermented Coffee. look familiar? You probably think this is what owning hearing aids would be like. Let me tell you, there's a better way. The Atom by Audion Hearing. The all-new Audion Atom is the world's first wireless charging hearing aid under $100. The Atom comes with an easy-to-use wireless charging dock. Plus, the Atom has a 22% smaller design so it's nearly invisible when worn in the ear. That's why we have over 250,000 happy customers. Each pair has a 45-day money-back guarantee, so there is zero risk in trying them. Call 1-800-918-3109. That's 1-800-918-3109. Call 1-800-918-3109 or go to audionhearing.com to get your pair of Audion Atom hearing aids for only $99. I am Li Ching Yun, the founder of Kwai Shan Fang. In Taiwan, we have the world's largest cypress forest. My father especially loves the forest scent emitted by the cypress forest. To bring the forest's fragrance to my father and family, I founded Kwai Shan Fang. We aim to provide you with the most natural cypress forest essence. Welcome back. Unusual tours in Rome are showing visitors new ways of seeing the city. Vespa sidecars and river rafts offer tourists a new perspective on the Italian capital. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. 
Vespa mopeds are the quintessential mode of Italian transportation. Now tourists are riding in their sidecars for a different view of Rome. Luca Di Trapano is a local guide and owner of Vespa Sidecar Tour. It is unique, a different perspective. We are at 360 degrees. Of course, we tour guides look at the road, that's clear. But the client in Rome, it is like being in a bubble. And so there are all the monuments seen from a completely different perspective, with the possibility to appreciate many more details. The tours are a hit with visitors looking for something different. That's why, of course, if, you know, like I said, the only thing, uh, depending on whether my, my family could do it, but me personally, I'm a, you know, so I think it's great. Food tours are also a hit. Local guides know all the hot spots. I recommend this tour because it's not um, uh, just a simple uh, food tour with uh, you know stops to eat and uh, and go, but it's uh, like um, uh, an experience, a real experience with a, a local guide that can give you some uh, you know some tips about the real uh, the real essence, the real uh, culture. Welsh tourist Simon Lee was satisfied. This is actually my second time in Rome, so I've done all the usual tours, um, Colosseum and all that. So we wanted to do something different. So I found uh, the food tour. I like to eat food, so <laughs> it made sense to try the food tour. For more active tourists, rafting adds some adventure to a Roman vacation. Guide Mariana Tedeschi says her clients see Rome from a unique perspective. The first time I came here just as a passion to help others bring people to the Tiber and I saw Rome in a very different way compared to seeing it from the usual streets along the usual places where there are a lot of people, traffic, a bit of weird noise. Instead, here it is very calm. For families with older children, alternative activities are a welcome addition to the usual itinerary. It has been a choice for my children. They are teenagers um, <laughs> and it's quite difficult to take care of them in a city with such a cultural heritage. They are not interested in doing for the sixth time a museum or for the second time even a castle. Turns out there's more than one way to see and enjoy the Italian capital. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. A senior Sumatran tiger couple finally becomes parents. A German zoo is celebrating the long-awaited birth of their offspring. These two male cubs are the first newborns of their kind in 10 years. Their father is 14 years old and their mother almost 10, both almost too old to have kids. The tiger family will stay together for about a year before the young tigers will move to another zoo. Sumatran tigers are listed as critically endangered by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. They live in the rainforests of Indonesia. The species now has only a few hundred members due to threats to their habitat. Meanwhile, a zoo in central Poland has also embraced newcomers, two male Persian leopard cubs. Officials say they are one of the rarest leopard subspecies in the world. Footage shows the newborns playing around with their mother. The zoo said the leopard cubs will continue to drink their mother's milk for a month or two. Officials have invited the public to suggest names for the new arrivals. Thank you for tuning in today. I'm Chris Beers.